Hello, I'm Pocho Salcedo, New York. A warm welcome to our audience across Latin America, the continental U.S. and Hawaii. Thank you for sharing these minutes with us. This is not just the news. This is the DNA of the news, information you can trust. Today, we're going to see food and cooking in a different way. The history of food and cooking and how they have shaped societies and cultures throughout human history. This is a journey throughout time, examining how the quest for food has been a primary driver of empire building and cultural exchange. For this, we have invited one of the most internationally recognized experts on the matter. Rachel Lawton, welcome to the DNA of the news. I'm delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Rachel Loudon is author of Cuisine and Empire, Cooking in World History, on the links between culture, economy, and food, as well as she has also much reprinted article A Plea for Culinary Modernism, Why We Should Love Fast, Modern, Processed Food. Raised on a large, commercially successful farm in southern England, Rachel studied geology prior to receiving her PhD in History and Philosophy of Science from University College London. She enjoyed a productive academic career in the United States before resigning to move to Mexico in her mid-50s to have more time to write. In 2018, she won the Paradigm Award of the Breakthrough Institute. She now lives in Lexington, Kentucky. Rachel, you have a wealth of life experiences and unusual backgrounds. You were born on a farm in England, started starting with a geology degree. Then you embark on a PhD in history and philosophy of science. You lived in the U.S. and Pittsburgh and Virginia and Hawaii. Uh, were you interested in studying food as a social phenomenon, I think it started. Then you moved to Mexico, lived there for 15 years, then back in the U.S. and Texas and Central Kentucky. You wrote uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, monographies and three books, one of them on the foundations of mineralogy and geology and two of them on the impact of food on the way we live. What would you like to share with us from that life journey? I think what holds it all together uh, is an interest in how history uh, shapes us and informs what we do. Uh, I grew up in a part of England. The farm I lived on uh, had Mesolithic flints on it. My father collected buckets of them. Stonehenge was a playground just down the road. Um, and I found history oppressive. I thought, how do I escape this long past. And so geology is a historical science. I started with that, and I have moved through different areas of history ever since. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Rachel, it's an honor to have you in the program. And let us go right away to the deep side of the pool. Your work is a structure around the idea that cuisines are the result of the complex interplay between politics, economics, and technology. And one of your fundamental pre uh, premises is that the development of cooking has been a key factor in the rise and fall of empires and has been uh, as influential as wars and economic policies shaping the world. Please unpack that a little bit for us. Oh, my goodness. That's a big one. That's my whole book. Um, <laughs> let me begin with cooking. We're a very odd species in the animal world because we are a few animals do prepare their food in various ways, but none of them to the extent that humans do. And what I wanted to find out was what difference did cooking make in the history of the world and what caused changes in cooking. And when I say cooking, I don't mean just going to the stove and frying an egg. I mean transforming harvested plants and animals into something edible. So that includes not just heat and cold, 
but cutting and grinding, um, treating with water or alkali, um, using fermentation, a whole series of incredibly ingenious uh, ways of making uh, tough grains, animal carcasses, things that we can and want to put in our mouths. Because we make our food and we don't just go out as, um, say, a cow would and graze the field, taking whatever comes except what we know is inedible, um, we uh, are able to think about how we want to shape that food. And so what we do is uh, we don't think about it every day when we cook. But um, as soon as any debates come up, you realize that underneath how we prepare our food are very basic beliefs about us and the natural world, including our own bodies, um, and all the diet discussion is about that, about us in the social world, um, how do we relate to other people, how do we relate to people of different classes, different races, and if we believe in a supernatural world, how do we relate to that? Uh, all religions have multiple uh, rules for cooking and eating. So uh, when you want to understand how food evolves and changes, you have to look um, not just at plants and animals, but at what uh, different systems of thought have said about how we should um, eat and uh, prepare our food. Um, I haven't got on to empires yet, but maybe your readers would like a tiny breather before I begin on that. Sure, sure. I I uh, I will say that for most of us uninitiated, food is typically viewed as a source of nutrition. But as you mentioned, uh, your point of view is also a source that drives the expansion of civilizations, foster cultural exchanges and it has contributed to the complex tapestry of global history. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, what happens is that um, we don't just cook at random. We cook in a system. I call a system a cuisine, a style of cooking. There's not a very good word for it in English, or come to that actually in Spanish. Um, gastronomia doesn't quite capture it. Um, but there are very distinct styles of cooking, as anyone will discover when they travel. And uh, what I found when I looked at world history was that um, the great empires of the world, which have been the political systems in which the bulk of the world's population has lived, for the last, oh, uh, at least seven or 8,000 years, um, tend to be associated with a distinct style of cooking. Um, nowadays, we might talk about an American style of cooking, which has gone around the world with hamburgers. But this style of cooking um, requires a set of ingredients, it um, a set, therefore, land, it requires um, uh, the people and the processes to turn those ingredients into food. And so um, when empires expand, um, they do so by sending military, missionaries, uh, merchants, uh, diplomats um, around the world or outside the empire, and these individuals carry the cuisine with them. Um, it's not quite as simple as one cuisine, one empire. The Roman Empire had a cuisine, but it spilled over its borders um, into other areas. Uh, I think one, re one mechanism for this is that if 
you have a cuisine associated with an empire. Um, and that empire is perceived as the Roman Empire was, the Persian empires were. Later on um, in the 16th and 17th century, the Spanish Empire was as powerful and successful and expansive. People look at it and they say, hmm, now why is this empire so strong? And one answer they come up with it, I call it dietary determinism, is that we are what we eat. And if we eat the right things, we are going to be powerful people, and that will translate into a powerful empire. Um, in uh, your book also uh, focuses as a cornerstone in this uh, uh, phenomenon of the agrarian fundamentals, the roots of gastronomy traditions, the agricultural practices of ancient civilizations, and uh, how staples like uh, wheat, rice, and corn form the base of uh, really um, not only the empires, but cultures. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. I mean, the great turning point, um, I think, after um, uh, humans emerged, it's often thought to be the emergence of agriculture. I think it actually comes before that. I think it's what I call the mastery of grains. Um, the ones we think about are the ones you mentioned, wheat, maize, rice, but there are other ones that are not so obvious, oats, millet, sorghum, and so on. These are extraordinary uh, resources. Um, they comprise, if you can prepare them correctly, almost a, correct, a completely nutritionally sufficient diet. They can be transformed into multiple different things, You can have not just the grain, but you can have alcohol from it. You can usually have sugar from it. You can have oil from it. So they're the, this extraordinary resource. The downside of these grains is that they are very tiny and very hard. And if you eat them raw, they're just going to go through your system and basically come out the other end. So you have to find some way of turning these grains into something edible. And that is uh, using a grindstone. Um, it's always a woman. The woman kneels down in front of the grindstone. Um, the simple ones are shaped like a saddle, and she works incredibly hard to break down these grains into flour that can then be transformed into a whole range of different things. Maybe I'm going a little bit ahead, but um, I heard you in one of your uh, interviews, you were speaking about the tortillas made in the rural areas of Mexico and how they were made and the nutrition that came from those tortillas compared to the, let's say, industrial or tortillas that we Uh, see on the tables here in the United States, for example? Oh, the tortilla, Mexican methods with maize are quite extraordinary. That's, maize um, is an easy plant to grow. It's a difficult plant to process because it, it is, those grains really are so hard. And at some point, Mexican, and I'm sure it was women, because it's always women who are doing the processing, um, discovered that if they heated them in hot water with the addition of something alkali, nowadays they use lime from building materials, but in the past they could use ash or some other naturally occurring alkali. The grain softened and they could be more easily ground. And when they had been ground, they could be shaped into a flexible cake, which will not happen if you simply grind grains dry. Um, this process is called nixtamalization. And 
nobody could have thought about it when they were doing it, but it had this amazing side effect, namely that if you do that, the grains become, the, the maize becomes more, not less nutritious. We often think now that processed food is going to be less nutritious. Here's a case where processing makes it more nutritious. And so um, the countries, the people that uh, nixtamalized their maize and made tortillas from that um, turned out to be much, much healthier than um, the people who accepted maize later on um, people in Romania, Italy, the American South, who didn't know how to do this and just ground the grains dry and developed a terrible deficiency disease called pellagra that killed thousands of people way up through the 1930s. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. We're back with Rachel Lawton. She joins us from Lexington, Kentucky, here in the United States of America. Rachel, the age of exploration and colonization opened new routes for gastronomic exchanges as explorers brought back novel ingredients from very distant lands, crops like potatoes, tomatoes, and chiles, from the Americans were integrated into the old world cuisines, fundamentally changing diets and agricultural patterns. Sugar and spices drove colonial trade networks, leading to economic and political shifts with lasting impacts on global eating habits. Tell us a little bit about that period, please. Yes, this period from the 15th century, well, for the next several centuries, um, sees the world united in a set of trade routes. Um, and it's often pu called the period of the Columbian Exchange after Columbus. And there's been a huge amount written about how the transfer mainly of animals like uh, cattle, pigs, goats, sheep to the Americas and um, the um, reverse transfer of plants like um, maize and uh, chiles to um, Eurasia um, was transformative to the cuisines of uh, both parts of the world that had been previously separated. Uh, I want to complicate that story a little bit because what I saw in my research was that, uh, and just from living in Mexico, that uh, it is true that this exchange of ingredients occurred. But as I said, ingredients, um, plants and animals are not food. They have to be transformed. And the transformation of food went only one way, by and large. It went from um, Europe and Asia to the Americas. It did not go from the Americas to uh, Asia and Europe. Take, for example, um, maize, uh, corn, which I have uh, was talking about before. The process of nixtamalization of heating corn in alkali um, that did so much to transform it into something tastier and more nutritious, never reached Europe. When chiles, which in Mexico are used not simply for uh, piquancy, for heat, but for uh, color, for texture, for flavor, went to Eurasia, they forgot the texture, the flavor, and the color, and they concentrated solely on heat. So that um, with the exception, perhaps, of cacao, of chocolate, um, the what is sometimes called the old world um, never benefited from many of the culinary techniques of the Americas, 
was very sad. Well, let's talk a little bit about the period of industrialization and the impact on food production. I heard you speaking at one point in a reference of the percentage of income that the average family would have spent three, four hundred years ago compared to what happened after industrialization and the uh, uh, advent of refrigeration, uh, canned foods, etc. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that changed our diets and the way we approach food. Well, it's a process that's still going on. It's very recent. It really began really about a hundred years ago. Um, we have a romantic view of cuisine in the past because what we know about it comes down from literate society. And the literate society was the wealthy. Um, in fact, through most of history, um, there was a small percentage of people maybe five, maybe 10% of the population who could afford meat, who could afford sugar, who could afford fat, who could afford spices and other exotic um, things. And there was um, 90 or 95% of the population who lived basically on the less interesting grains and um, uh, and beans. And uh, what happened and was quite extraordinary with um, the industrialization of food and also changes in ideas about politics was that um, it gradually became possible in the richer countries and um, then spreading around the world to for more and more of the world's population to enjoy the meat, fat, sugar, spices that previously had been um, restricted to a very tiny number of people. And the, um, I mean, it's really odd because if this is in the last hundred years, this is also a time when people are moving out of agriculture, moving to the cities. And when people's standard of living in many parts of the world is creeping up. And yet they are able, um, in increasing numbers of the world's population are not starving, and not only not starving, but able to eat a diet that their parents or grandparents um, could not have imagined Um I could give examples from various places. but Please, yeah. please, please, please. Well, I, I mean, I look at my own grandmother's um, uh, kind of uh, diet. I mean, for her, um, and this was in the 1920s, a uh, dinner for one night of the week was simply bread with an onion boiled in milk. Um, and that was it. Um, when I was in Mexico, I asked this little girl um, what was her favorite dinner, and she said, caldo de pollo, chicken soup. And you realize that this was something that her mother and her grandmother had not enjoyed because they had not yet, when they were children, um, the big animal feed industry and the large scale chicken production had not begun. And if she ever had, if her mother had meat, it was um, at a wedding when they killed a pig, but it was only two or three times a year. Oh. And it was. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, what you wish you knew at the beginning of your journey on food, on the interaction with culture, that you know now that would have helped you to understand the process a lot faster and easier? I wish I'd known how long it would take me. <laughs> it took me 20 years. Um, it, uh, on the other hand, I don't know if I could do it now. When I started, there was very little being done on food history. Not nothing, but very little and almost nothing on Africa, 
um, much of Asia, um, much of much of Latin America. Um, now there is really interesting work um, understanding um, food history worldwide. Um, that is wonderful, but it would have made my task impossible. There would have been too much material. And what is the one thing that we uh, who are watching this uh, presentation should take home and remember when we think about food, culture, and uh, the impact of food on our lives? That... Uh, Agricultural products, plants and animals, are not food. Food is a human creation. It's one of our most marvelous creations. And if you understand it, you understand a great deal about uh, human culture. Rachel, thank you very much for being such a wonderful guest. Uh, your work is notable for its interdisciplinary approach drawing from history, anthropology, gastronomy, and economics to provide us with a comprehensive view of culinary evolution. You challenged us today to consider how something as everyday cooking can have a profound implication for empire building, cultural exchange, and the transformations in society. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for asking such wonderful questions. Gracias. Thank you for joining us on this journey of information and dialogue. Until we meet again, stay truly informed. See you in our next edition.